um, Welcome to Liquid Margins, Social Annotation, Bridging Theory and Practice. Today's guests are Cindy Garcia, Associate Professor of Theater Arts and Dance at the University of Minnesota. Melinda Lindquist, Associate Professor of History at the University of Minnesota. Jiren Zhu, Jinren Zhu, excuse me, PhD student in learning technologies. And today's guest moderator, Bodong Chen, Associate Professor in Learning Technologies, also from the University of Minnesota. So we've got, I don't know what their mascot is, but you know, go fireflies or whatever it is. It's all University of Minnesota today. Might be mosquito, not sure. Okay, so, and I'm Franny French and I'm your host today and I'm going to now stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to our guest moderator, moderator Bodong. Welcome Bodong. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Franny. And welcome everybody to this episode of Liquid Margins. I'm Bodong Chen. I am an associate professor in learning technologies and uh, at the University of Minnesota, our mascot is gophers. Um, so we're all gophers here. We're super excited for this opportunity to share uh, a really recent partnership we have been building in the past semester at the University of Minnesota around social annotation. Um, so now I just want to um, ask our panelists um, maybe to jump in and tell a little bit about yourself, uh, including what is your primary role at the, the university, what's your academic or even you know hobbies or academic interests and personal interest, just to um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. So Cindy, do you want to kick us off? Sure, I'm Cindy Garcia. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Theater, Arts and Dance. I uh, have an interest in um, baile popular, which is uh, Latin American social dance, popular dance. So my first book is on um, salsa dancing called Salsa Crossings, Dancing Latinidad in Los Angeles. So I, and I really like to think about how um, the social, like race, racism, gender, um, social class all play out um, in relation to people in social spaces. Uh, and yeah, I'm a former elementary school teacher in a, at an experiential progressive school and that really informs a lot of how I teach. So thanks. Melinda, do you want to go next? Sure, thank you so much. Um, I'm Melinda Lindquist and I'm an associate professor of history. Um, and my primary areas are US history, African American history, gender history, and intellectual history. And my work thinks a lot about the ways in which um, social scientists construct knowledge about race and gender in the United States. And the current project that I'm working on is um, a history of the achievement gap and sort of thinking about what that sort of the discursive work um, of even that sort of notion of, you know, having a term like the achievement gap does. Um, but I'm also really interested in the ways in which social scientists um, and also um, lawyers and legal scholars, as well as youth have engaged in debates about education and achievement. Um, and I would just say that, uh, thank you for the invitation today. Um, but there, and there's been something very nice about working with this tool and actually sort of thinking about um, sort of notes and notation and the ways in which they're very much sort of you know linked to to learning, which is something I'm much more um, interested in than than achievement. Um, so thank you. Shunan, please jump in. So um, thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Shunan. I'm a second year PhD student in learning technologies at the University of Minnesota. And now I'm also working as a graduate instructional designer at the College of Design that supports online teaching and other online learning initiatives. And before I came to UMN, I did my master in educational psychology at the University of uh, Connecticut. So research wise, I'm interested in learning analytics and online collaborative learning. I'm now exploring uh, connecting social annotations and learning analytics techniques 
to support teaching and learning online. Thanks for having me today. All right, wonderful. Thanks everybody for your quick introduction. Uh, I also want to give a sh great shout out, a big shout out to uh, two colleagues who are in attend who are attending the webinar, um, uh, who are Shana Grossen, who is an educational technologist at the College of Liberal Arts, who has been doing unlimited support for this partnership, and also Hong Shui, a PhD student working with me and Xunan on the research and design side of this partnership. So a big kudos to them as well. Um, personally, I have been using Hypothesis. I've been interacting with Hypothesis for, for a while, for many years. Um, I have different hats. I use it as an instructor myself. I teach uh, using Hypothesis in my um, graduate level and undergraduate level courses. And also have a huge interest in, like Maninda was uh, talking about, how annotation as a knowledge practice is connected to other parts of learning and cognition, uh, which expands my interest to you know designing, uh, in incorporating annotation in uh, workflows as young as high schoolers, to see whether they can you know bridge. Uh, their classroom discussion with what's going on in the news around climate change and so that we can design uh, newer pedagogical practices to really enable new type of learning in the classroom. So I really appreciate um, being able to work, um, being able to use and incorporate hypothesis in all kinds of settings. Um, and that really transitioned to my next question to our panelists. That is, how did you learn about social annotation and, and why did you uh, use hypothesis in your class in the past four semester? Uh, please feel free jumping. We don't need to necessarily go in order, but Cindy, you're ready. Okay. Uh, I learned about it through a workshop this summer um, where Shauna Crossan was there, a, a technology consultant um, at the University of Minnesota. And um, I think maybe Shenron was there and Hong and Bodong, you may have been there too. Um, and I, I remember getting really excited about this idea of hypothesis and social annotation. And I pursued um, getting the integration um, into uh, my Canvas site. Um, and I went to this special training um, just for hypothesis and social annotation, which was exciting to me. Um, probably the most exciting thing I learned about online teaching this past summer. And I was excited about it for a couple of reasons. Um, I was going to be teaching, I was developing a course, Dance History, that I had inherited that I was wanting to change up and really think about it. it. It's a writing intensive course. And I really wanted to think about how to teach writing um, in a way that um, students could really pay attention to the texts that they were reading in order to um, learn from the writing strategies of those authors and then uh, incorporate them into their own writing. So that was one thing that was exciting to me. And another was just really focusing on how do you read a, the, one of these university level texts? Uh, it's hard enough to read by yourself. <laughs> and so when you get to read with your, um, with co-students, uh, it's really wonderful um, for the students to share their knowledge with each other. Um, so I wanted to incorporate um, one, this cooperative learning model that I used to use when I taught elementary school. And also I used to teach reading. So I had all this training on comprehension strategies. Um, and so I would include that as, as prompts for students to annotate. So things like using prior knowledge, you know, what's familiar, um, identifying the main idea or the argument, um, asking questions, what's new to you, um, making connections. And then another time we had a, an annotation based on what in this reading sparks your curiosity. So that, that's how I got it, it, excited about all of this. So maybe pass it to Melinda. 
Thank you. Um, I similarly was introduced to the to the tool by uh, by Shauna Crossan, which was um, which was wonderful. I was really very excited about it. Um, and I think part of the reason I was excited about it is because um, before learning about the tool, I had started to shift my teaching practice um, in, my, in the large survey course that I teach. And so, which is also a writing intensive course. And there's a lot of attention to, you know, like writing a certain type of, you know, thesis driven essay that has, you know, that engages deeply with primary sources. And as I was rethinking that course um, last year before hearing about um, hypothesis, I had come to the conclusion that, that I think that some of the most important work and thinking that scholars do is in the process of reading and taking notes. And so last spring, um, I revamped that course and all of a sudden note taking became one of the most important things that the students did. It was the one assignment that they were always required to, um, you know, like that was basically like the week's assignment. They would work through different types of things around writing, um, but each week they had to always submit their notes. And so I think that since I was already sort of shifting my thinking in terms of the ways in which scholars do so much thinking in terms of annotation um, and how they sort of deeply engage with the text before they move on to, you know, forming a thesis and, you know, you know, writing um, and through that process. So I think that when I heard about the tool um, from Shauna, I was excited because I had become excited about note taking. Um, and, and then this, this time, um, since you gave a little bit of a preview of some of the ways that you have been um, using the tool in your class, um, the, in my class, the students spend a fair amount of time in the beginning, really like just thinking about notes as an individual, you know, how, they're do, how they do that individually, trying lots of different types of note taking techniques that historians use, different techniques for primary sources versus the sort of techniques and approaches um, for, for secondary sources. And then um, social annotation just really comfortably fit into that because then the next step was now what is it to what is it to take notes collaboratively? What does that sort of open up in terms of opportunities for learning or for questioning? Or sometimes there's lots of works like how does it also help in terms of the distribution of labor to make, you know, to make actually the work more accessible to students. Um, you know, on weeks where the where the reading where the reading is heavier, how is it that we can sort of share? And so I've just found it to be a tool that I think, um, you know, I was introduced to the to the tool at the moment that I was actually ready to think and really be able to engage with the tool just because of um, how important I think notation is. And then it really opened up a lot of different opportunities for how to use the tool, especially in the context of the pandemic how to how this tool creates community when it can be very difficult to create community when I mean I was in a course where I had no you know physical contact with my students and normally that course is set in an active learning classroom where there are 14 tables of nine and they're mostly sitting and facing each other because the course is very conversational and so the tool also helped to sort of bridge some of the gaps um, that were created, I think, in the learning experience uh, because of the pandemic. One reason I really enjoy talking with both Cindy and Melinda every time is just to listen to them processing their thinking on teaching and ways to support really deep disciplinary uh, engagement in specific area. They're, they're really thinking deeply. And, um, so it, I always learn new things, you know, just every time I meet with them. Um, I would like to right now turn to Xinran um, because you led a systematic review last year, or sorry, earlier this year. Um, and that's really before this partnership was born. And then when we had the chance to pilot hypothesis at the University of Minnesota, and then kind of all the, all the dots are connected. Uh, it was exciting for me because there's a, such a group, great group of faculty members and instructors who are piloting this. We have been thinking about social and collaborative annotation as part of our research. 
Um, and then that took off, you know, the partnership took off just because of mutual interest from both the research side and also the, uh, the educational practice side. Um, so Xunan, can you tell us a bit more about how this partnership looked like and which kind of activity we, we had that really, you know, which kind of contribution we brought on the table to make this happen? Yeah, um, so first I would say in general, I think this has been a very meaningful collaboration among instructors and technology consultants, instructional designers and researchers. So as researchers, we have been interested in social annotation for a while. Uh, last March, a group of us wrote a paper uh, about social annotation in response to COVID-19. And we developed a strong desire to partner with instructors to design uh, solutions for online teaching. So this summer, Shanna um, helped us connect instructors to collaborate. And um, so Shanna is really supportive and passionate about the project. And with Shanna's help, Cindy and Melinda and another instructor were on board of our research. So I think, I think there are two key elements in our partnership. First, as we collaborate, I would say um, we all have shifted our identities. We're not just researchers and they're not just educators. I would call us as um, call us all as research informed practitioners as we're all trying to turn research into practice by co-designing co -designing the social annotation activities. In our co-design meetings, um, Cindy and Melinda share their course objectives, their insights and their teaching strategies. And then based on that, we introduce some scaffolding activities and collaborative learning strategies from the research literature. So through the interaction, we were able to integrate the research differently to fit in uh, different classes. And for the second element, I would say it's a strong rapport we have established uh, during our collaboration. Throughout this semester, we kept our routine design meetings as a chance to share both positive and negative updates and solve problems together. So um, our co-design has always been uh, an ongoing process. There were always great ideas coming from the design meetings and both Cindy, Melinda and Shanna have inspired us a lot. Um, so I really appreciate this great partnership. And I think these two elements have been the foundation of the project. Thanks a lot, Xunan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm together with you. I so appreciate this partnership. Um, and I want to, maybe it's a time to um, ask Cindy and Melinda specific because you already told us uh, about how the course looked like, right? How the, what are the key element about social annotation that uh, was, were introduced to your course. And I want to invite you to share a little bit more about, you know, what was the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week activities um, that we designed and, and we implemented? And what was the, how is it from the side of the teacher or how is, the side of, how is it from the side of the student? Which kind of strategies did we co-design that were eventually implemented in your course? Well, I, I do want to thank Shirin um, and Hong and Bodung for the collaboration. It was it was wonderful to be able to sit um, on Zoom several times throughout the semester um, and plan. And my original uh, intention was really only to use the tool um, in for for two assignments. Um, and so, but to do those two assignments, were, which were week four and five we met and we developed the scaffolding. So in my very first class, um, and since again, I was saying that the model for the class is a very much collaborative learning model. So, you know, there were portions of our synchronous meeting times where it was, you know, sort of lecture or large group interactions, but there were lots of small group interactions. And so I introduced the tool, the very first class, when um, I had them break up into conversations to read a set of guidelines to think about how groups can work, how groups work well together and how they you know, might not work well together. So it was really helpful having these conversations to think about how to introduce a tool, which is a very different type of tool, but then to slowly give 
the students, but also myself, because it was my first time using it really, um, a comfort. So the plan was, you know, primarily for these week four and week five assignments, which were groups around small groups, as well as large groups that were either annotating historiographic pieces or primary sources. Um, but to get there, we had that initial meeting um, and then I continued to um, introduce the tool slowly before we got to those first two assignments. And then the main thing that I had them do, I had them use the tool, but I never graded them on the work of using the tool. But what I did ask them to do after they used the tool was to reflect on the process of social annotation, um, both for dealing with primary sources as well as dealing for um, historiographic um, articles. And after that, uh, I decided to use it basically throughout the rest of the semester. So that was my original intention, but then I kept coming back and having conversations with you um, about how to continue to use the tool, how to extend its use. Um, and it was really always very helpful because as we, as the use would change, we would try to make sure that certain things remain stable. So I remember one conversation we decided, you know, we're making these different types of changes and how we're going to use the tool, but what we want to keep constant are the group members in a group when they're using the tool in a different type of way. Um, and so I think that's that scaffolding throughout was really helpful and then making sure that just like certain variables were changing um, uh, over the course of the semester and the tool was functioned in a lot of in a lot of ways so it was definitely a conversational because it did create the space for conversations between the students it was reflective because note taking is so important in my class and i required them to reflect both on sort of individual as well as um, the note taking that they do in social annotation um it was also at the by the end because then i incorporated it more fully we ended up uh, reading a book together where each group um, had um, ownership of a certain chapter and then produced a final presentation about their chapter. So then we spent a class where basically we worked our way through an entire book, but the tool was this wonderful learning space to then create you know, these final products. So that was the one place where it was also like very specifically productive of a certain type um, of writing as opposed to sort of conversational or reflective. And I would, the other thing I would say is that I had a class where I invite um, like about 13 faculty members to come and uh, talk about, there's a course about the 1960s. So they talk about 1968, like all around the world. And for that week, the students also read primary sources from, you know, South Africa or Mexico or Canada. And what I really liked about the tool that week is that it made it really easy because for that week, I just invited all the faculty into the tool. And so it created this space for the faculty coming in, you know, like not knowing the students, they're only going to spend an hour with them, but they were able to come in and already have a sense of the conversation. So it, the tool was also very invitational in that, you know, you could sort of invite people into conversations. So, um, yeah, I ended up just, I used it in a lot of different ways. I used it um, at a certain point. Um, I gave people a choice about like whether to opt into conversations based upon uh, based upon gender, if they wanted to mean a male or a female or a non-binary or mixed group. And so it also did allow for these different types of, um, of configurations. Um, I really like Melinda, how you talked about reflection. Uh, Anyway, uh, but yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, well, in our in our class in dance history, uh, when I think I met with Sinron and Hong uh, and Bodong at the beginning, it was still in the summer, I think. And um, also my TA, um, Jason Knorr, who might be out there in the chat. Um, we uh, were talking about how to develop assignments and um, I think it was Sinran and Hung who talked about these roles and introduced Jason and I to this way of approaching uh, this social annotation. So one is the facilitator. So a student would be assigned the role of facilitator. And uh, as 
the students were all collectively reading over the weekend, um, preparing for Tuesday's class. The facilitator's job was to jump in and encourage the conversation, make some connections, um, point out who's agreeing, who's disagreeing um, to further the conversation. Uh, and I think Senran, you were saying, this is sort of the, the how, like how do we get this conversation going? And then the what, it was the, the next role was the summarize, or sorry, the synthesizer. And the synthesizer um, for Tuesday's class uh, jump starts our class conversation by um, synthesizing um, the conversation that we had about the annotations from Tuesday. Um, they bring up the ideas, they bring up disagreements, but they're really pulling these ideas together um, and asking questions for us to think about for the Thursday class. Um, and then the summarizer would turn in a summary of the week's findings, um, discourse, arguments, um, tensions, um, questions that we developed and create a summary. So we would stop, you know, so that so that's facilitator, synthesizer, and summarizer. And Jason and I noticed a couple, two or three weeks into this that it was really getting slippery between the different roles and we needed to pause and work with, well, we had to actually to ask Shinran and Hong, um, okay, we, we have to just get clear on this again. So um, we really tried to delineate more clearly, um, but you know, what's the difference between these roles and how can we com communicate that better to students? So we recreated a document that we could share with students about what, what are the possible ways to respond within each role. And the students actually helped develop that too. We asked them, what did they think? What, how did they uh, activate this role? So uh, we had that list going and that really improved their work. And it really improved the quality of the way that they performed these roles and even the way that the other students then would respond. Um, to the synthesizer or be able to use the summary, they started to realize, okay, we spent some time talking about what's the difference between a synthesis and a summary. These are two different kinds of writing. So this became some of the part of the focus of, of a writing intensive course. They were doing annotations. They were doing um, facilitation, writing as facilitation. Um, syntheses and summaries, as well as writing reflections. Um, so, um, oh, I can share that document if I can find it. You, you just got to email me, um, Kearsley Stewart. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, that was that was really probably a really powerful uh, experience. It lasted the whole semester. It took a lot of energy, and students really had to do like complete their roles by a certain point uh, each week. So we had really clear deadlines. And then, you know, when the facilitator was done, all the students would be done doing this by Sunday evening. So I was going to teach on Tuesday. I would go reread this article and look at what the students said. And I could notice things like where were they, where do they really understand what this author is saying? Where did they really go off on some, uh, with some other idea? Um, sometimes students weren't really clear about like the history of blackness or ways to think about race and racism. And so um, rather than pointing out, you know, people in a, in a conversation, um, in class discussion, I could really back up and scaffold ways to talk about um, race and racism if students hadn't really done that before. Um, sometimes students would pull out quotes that the author would use uh, and they would sort of decontextualize them. And then I would say, aha, they're just looking at the quote. They're not looking at how the author is using this quote to create an argument. So the author doesn't believe in this colonialist idea of racism um, and dehumanizing um, 
enslaved Africans. It's the quote that is, is creating this idea. So I would back up. So in, in the class that I would lead, I would look at the where the author is structuring her argument. And then I would bring that quote up and say, why did the author use this quote? So I could, I could really recreate um, and scaffold better um, when I was teaching. And so the idea of any kind of pre-planned lecture um, is not really part of how I used this. It really is like you are really teaching to the students um, who are in your class and the ideas that they bring. So it's always, you're always recreating ideas and learning together. I, I love the way you're putting it, Cindy, that it's, it's always recreating ideas. And I also appreciate both of you, um, your openness in terms of rethinking what learning is in your course and rethinking le how learning can happen in your course in the, such a special semester, right? There's a lot of design efforts that was were put in um, like reimagination of the course and how what writing is, for example, writing could be very linear, but the way you're describing it is reflective, conversational, facilitatory, and, and so on. So I really appreciate that. Uh, in the meantime, I, I'm looking at the time. So I am gonna pose one final question to all of you. Um, First to Xinran is we have been, you know, this research still ongoing, um, but I wonder what type of research ideas you think will be on the horizon in terms of, you know, this only first round of this partnership and what will be coming out next. And also to Cindy and Melinda, if you're going to do this again, I hope that's the case for the spring, no pressure, but that, that's my hope. Um, how might you do it differently? How might you use hypothesis differently? What are the hopes you have as an instructor that we want to explore further? So Ashina, do you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we did a literature review this year on social annotation and we found there are uh, great nuances with designing and social uh, annotation activities. So at the same time, uh, one major focus from the current li literature, as I see, is, the, is that uh, some studies have been focusing on describing the application and results of the technologies or interventions in online or hybrid classes, but there are not enough studies to define the design process nor explore how the design plays out over time. And also as instructors, they're always very busy with their teaching workload is challenging for them to gain useful information from research. So I feel like there's a gap between research studies in one specific classroom and other classrooms outside of the research. So as the technology matures, it will be nice to distill design patterns, test them in various settings, and then uh, make them broadly available for instructors to consider and apply in their own classrooms. And also, um, we're also exploring building analytics tools first to help teachers uh, to have a better understanding of how their students are reading and annotating and to inform their uh, instructional decision-making. And also then we want to help uh, students to track their own learning and be more self-regulated and engage in the collaborative learning through the social annotation. Uh, thank you. Um... So in terms of, I definitely plan to use this in the future and I'm going to use it in a, I, I'm thinking I'm going to use it in a, in a pretty different way. So the course that I just taught, it was, a, it was a large course, but it was not a writing intensive course. And so I think that the tool, while our use of the tool was highly scaffolded and very conversational and reflective, and I frequently encourage them to use um, you know, the different types of sort of note-taking strategies and to bring those into social annotation, it, that was not a requirement in this course. And so thinking about the conversation like about Cindy and reflecting upon the use in that class, my plan next time in the, in the writing intensive course is to use a much more sort of directed um, and directive strategy with hypothesis. So this time around, 
I mean, I would read through their responses. I would definitely use their responses in the places that they were really interested in. I would highlight those points, or if I saw issues that need a clarification, I would definitely use that um, in the lectures and um, sort of like bringing those questions to the larger class. But I do think that um, in a writing intensive course, there's a lot of opportunity to use the tool to specifically do the work that I want the students to do in terms of, you know, like gaining confidence about, you know, what's a, what, what is a really strong thesis? How does one, you know, encounter it in the text? Um, and then how does one then think through their own primary sources to be able to generate um, a thesis of their own? So my plan is to move from this sort of more open-ended approach to a more directive strategy and I'm, I'm going to be really curious to see how the students responded. The students responded, I think, very favorably to the way that we used it in the course. I think that they really appreciated the fact that they could sort of use the tool how they wanted to use the tool. Um, and then just sort of thinking about research, and this is a conversation that we had when we were together. Um, and and one of the things I noted was right the ways in which the students in the course frequently responded, um, like there were lots of emotional responses in, in their annotation. And um, I think one thing that I've been curious about is what is this relationship between like emotional and effective responses and intellectual um, development and inquiry. And it strikes me that, that these things are actually very closely related, um, more closely related than we might think. Um, and, that, and that having, um, getting a sense and seeing their engagement in those terms, while my first um, response was maybe to think, oh, like this isn't the right type of use of this tool. By the end of the semester, I was thinking, actually, it's really important um, to have these types of reflections embedded in the annotation, not only because it's a very sort of authentic reflection of how they're encountering um, the sources, um, but also because I think that these things are, are closely related and I think it would be interesting to do more research just to think about these things. And in my course, I also did use um, something called a labor log. And so each week the students, and we talked about this as well in our conversations, each week when the students logged in their labor, they also did log in like their mood um, and their, you know, the different types of emotions that they were carrying through the course of doing the labor for the week. So I, I would be curious, and I, I think it'd be wonderful if there was research that continued to think around, around those types of questions. I would be interested um, in reading it and learning from it. Well, I'm definitely going to use this again. Next semester, I'm teaching an entirely different course and I haven't figured out how I'm gonna use this, but I will. Uh, when I teach dance history again, probably in the fall, I want to build in, it seemed like we, we just went at this pace, we really jumped in, which was great. And um, we had little times for reflection here and there, but I really want to do something where I reorganize the syllabus to maybe have a couple of weeks of reading and going through the process. And then another week where we don't have new readings, we really refine the process of the roles, um, how, do we, how are we making annotations, looking at specific annotations that we thought were really effective um, or that uh, reading somebody else's annotations, like how did that affect their own learning? So um, really having students dig into what have we done in these last, two, these first two weeks, right? Um, and then what have we learned like in terms of content? How are we thinking about diaspora by way of the Caribbean? Like, what are we learning here? And just kind of logging that together um, and then asking questions um, and then we'd start another like two or three week cycle and then another week off um, to try to really integrate together um, some of these new skills and really develop, really fine tune um, what we're learning so that they can um, keep developing these um, when they're reading um, at home uh, and making annotations. So that's that would be something to integrate. But also one day um, Sinran and Hong came in and 
they were asking the students, you know, what did they like about this platform, about social annotation, what were they learning, all of these questions. And one of the students started talking about how she how she read. She's like, oh, well, usually I read um, everything first. I read, I read the article twice before I even start to annotate. And I read everyone's comments um, and then I annotate. And then another student said, actually, I just read and I just annotate the first things and I um, and I don't, I just read it one time through. And another student had a different way of reading. And so I, I think that that discussion was really exciting for me because I then thought I want students to become aware that there's many ways to approach a text and they're all different. Um, that if you read the text twice and everyone's annotations first, that will help frame your thinking. Um, and you might be already reading to respond to one of those annotations, which is great. Um, and those annotations might help you understand the text um, more deeply. Uh, so, you know, if you read it all on your own and you don't look at annotations, that might bring a fresh, some fresh ideas. And then you put that in relation to other people's ideas. They're, they both work. And I think I, there are many other ways to, to read. And I really want to explore that with the students. How are they reading? Because not everyone has, comes with um, a deep understanding of how to read critically. And so this kind of collective learning really enhances everyone's, um, I think, ability to, to learn and, and understand course concepts. So yeah, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions from the chat. So Bodong, if I can um, love those to you and then you can love them to uh, different, uh, you can answer them or, or lob them to the guests whatever you'd like. Um, so Karen Labonte, or Labonte, and I should know how to pronounce her name because shout out to Karen, who's also in Portland and it attends so many Liquid Margins shows. It's always great to see you um, at some point or maybe in the chat, just tell me how to pronounce your last name. So I get that right. Uh, Karen says, um, would you say hypothesis affected your own research practices and conceptions of quote unquote research? It's a great question. Thank you. I'm happy to take that one. Um, and I, um, there was a chat in, in the chat channel that um, we actually, I as personally as a researcher, I use hypothesis daily uh, as part of my research workflow as you know, the day to day engagement with articles I read. And Shun, I mentioned about this um, literature review article we wrote in the spring, we actually, as a research group, we used hypothesis to do that literature review, uh, just because annotation itself, I think is fundamental for a researcher, you know, to mention, uh, Cindy and Melinda mentioned about note-taking as a reader. I think that's the same. It's, it's so embedded in our engagement with reading materials, whether it's on, a, on paper or whether it's on a PDF document or whether it's on a website. So that's, um, to me, having this hypothesis uh, infrastructure, I see it as actually a knowledge infrastructure for researchers to better archive our annotations, which could be emotional, could be very quick and uh, crappy in my, in my case, uh, uh, but so important to archive that moment of thinking and then revisit that at a later point to make synthesis to process that thinking further so that I can actually link that idea with my bigger research agenda. So I actually think it's very fundamental as a researcher to think about annotation and think about what tools can actually support that type of cognition as a researcher. Uh, so the next question is from Chris Andrews. Um, and he says, uh, we often talk about what worked in our classes in terms of social annotation. Do you have any experiences of what didn't work or didn't work as well as you'd hoped regarding social annotation use? And what do you think didn't, or, no, why do you think they didn't work? Sorry. And what adjustments did or will you make with social annotation in your courses? Another great question. Thank you, Chris. 
I, I mean, I would say that um, some of it's not that it didn't work. It was just learning how to use social annotation um, and um, experimenting. Uh, so my TA and I would talk about, uh, you know, Jason and I would be like, okay, what, what kind of comments are we getting? How can we get um, people to think about it uh, at deeper levels? And so, you know, we would pull out some of the annotations that were really um, thick or critical or just really well written, and just have students think about that. I don't, I don't think that the methodology is. Um, you know, it's just always learning how to do it with the students that you have and, and the discipline that you're in. So I wouldn't say that there's something that I would throw out necessarily. It was it would just be to like sometimes have more time to reflect and deepen the learning um, is what I would want to do. I mean, I think the only thing I would add is that I do think that because the students in my class had spent the two prior weeks really practicing with these very specific ways about how to read and take notes on primary sources and historiography, I think I did expect more of um, to see that carry through more in the social annotation. I, I encouraged it, I didn't require it, um, and I think, you know, a portion of the students, you know, took me up on that, but a large number didn't take me up on that. And so I do think also because my approach was much less, more sort of directive, like I would give people, I did in fact give lots of directions. So for example, in Cindy's um, earlier, when you were talking about the different types of ways of reading, um, even as they were using the tools, my instructions would be very specific. So sometimes I would say, I want you to do all of your reading and annotation separately before you go and use this tool. So you have the experience of what is it to have gone through that entire cognitive, cognitive process on your own and then use the tool. And then another time I said, I want you to only read within the tool and there will necessarily be, you might be the first person. So it might be the same process or you might be the 15th person. And then you're gonna to have to sort of juggle between how it, how it is to read and to see other people's ideas in the comments. So I think it, I mean, I think that the tool, I ended up finding like different ways to sort of use it or think about it, which I thought was helpful in terms of helping the students think about their own process of learning. Um, but there was less of that immediate translation. I mean, I had talked to them about using the tags um, and using, because both of the annotation forms like have an acronym. So I was thinking that they would sort of like use these tags and bring that those specific styles of annotation in. Um, and they really opted not to. And I didn't require it because also I wasn't, I didn't have in a course of 120 students, even with my two TAs, like we were not gonna be able to police and monitor um, that, that work. That, there was just no possibility of that. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I was, I was fine um, with that as well, but not, a, I don't know if it's a failure, but it was an opportunity that I think at first I thought, oh, like this is maybe a missed opportunity, but then it did open me up to just sort of like thinking more about the relationship between like the affective and the intellectual. Um, Melinda, can I say the tags? I forgot about the tags. Um, I would totally want to redevelop how I teach with the tags. Um, I tried and um, they were just sort of a thing that students did that we I didn't pursue um, in a way to, to make sure that they were cohesive or that we we're trying to identify particular categories that we could go back and use. And so that is actually a something that didn't work so well because I was focusing on so many other things. Um, but, you know, I teach dance history one. So if the person who teaches dance history two, now that the students are trained, you know, maybe she will like, okay, in this course, we're gonna develop the tags. So I think there's so much to do um, that the students could actually break it up into different semesters, different courses. So, yeah. To sort of a follow up, I know, um, Bodong, you um, 
gave Karen a response in the chat, but I thought it might be worth um, just taking this last question, kind of exploring it a little bit. Do you share your own learning processes with students? Yeah, I, I do. I do like to geek out <laughs> a little bit. It depends on which semester I'm teaching. And I do tend to geek out about, you know, how do I think about knowledge workflows and to chat with them about, of, of course, also learn from them as well, uh, how they think about knowledge practices, how they think about, you know, as they're different, they have different professional identities, how they think about what is knowledge and and how is knowledge generated and, and how does it look like to work as a community? Because I always bring up the idea of community together whenever I teach. And um, how does it look like as a community where beauty and knowledge together? And, and that will really be connected to the use of social annotation in my course, because we're annotating for our collaborative sense making of very dense ideas, sometimes very technical ideas, that no one know all those ideas, but as a, as a group, as a community, we can conquer and, and really make sense of those ideas together and then build new ideas. So, so that aspect of my teaching, I think every semester I will spend a bit of time just geeking out with my student and chatting with them so that we have that basic community culture um, already built before going to the tools. And I think that I didn't, I really appreciate the question from Karen, but I didn't do any research yet about how that might have impacted students, um, but it will be a, a great thing to do, a great um, research idea to explore as a next step. That's great. Um, hey, we're uh, one minute before the top of the hour. I think we should probably wrap this up. I just want to thank you all for coming and this has been so amazing. Great show and thanks everyone. Um, in the chat. It's a really good chat. Um, there's a lot of bonding going on in there. I always love to see that and people helping people. So it's sort of like the annotation of the show. And again, there's real community going on there. So um, thank you all for coming. And I hope to see everybody again in January when we, after the holidays, we'll start back up with liquid margins. So please join us. Um, this record, this is being recorded and the recording should be available this Monday, possibly beforehand. So look for that. And um, thank you again for coming and have a great weekend.